Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm going to give you a story. I heard a story about a guy who decided at a very young age that he was going to refrain from drinking and smoking his whole life. He had seen that it had caused his parents quite a bit of trouble. So guess what? I'm not going to play with that fire, pun intended. Well, as he went through life, his friends marveled at this. They couldn't imagine. Some of them smoked, but most all of them drank. And so they couldn't believe it, especially after he got married. <laughs> because if we're being honest, his wife was kind of mean. And they're like, how do you do that? I'm surprised she hasn't driven you to drink yet. Well, he made it <laughs> all the way to 80 surprisingly, right? <laughs> and his friends at his 80th birthday party, they're trying a new tactic. It's like, okay, so it changed things a little bit. They're like, you made it this far. We get it. We get why you wanted to do that. Look, you don't look a day over 60, and it's your 80th birthday party. You look great. You've kept healthy. But think about it. You're 80. You could die at any minute. You could die today. Aren't you curious as to what it was like to have a drink? And the guy's like, nah, I think I want to finish the race strong here. I'm almost there. I'm going to make it. But they keep just plugging away at him. And finally he goes, yeah, you're right. I could die tomorrow. What is one drink going to do? So here's the thing. They don't give him a wine cooler. They don't give him a light beer. They give him a Long Island iced tea. You all been to college, haven't you? <laughs> and so this is what happens, right? You know, you never drank anything, and then you go to college, and then the first drink you decide to have, or your friends decided for you, is a Long Island iced tea, right? All well, too. No good. How does pastor know that? Haven't always been a pastor. Anyway, <laughs> so it's bad news. And just like you did in college, he didn't wait, like, sip on it for three hours. No, he just slugged it back. Uh-oh, is right. He's now a poor decision maker. So they hit him with the next thing. Well, what about a cigarette? And he's like, yeah, cigarette sounds awesome. So gets a cigarette, friend pulls out the Zippo, clink, flick, 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 right? Remember that? <laughs> and, and then lights a cigarette for him. My wife is like, I can't believe he's going there. So anyway, yes, yes, real church, real people. Here we go. So he takes one drag of the cigarette, and dies right there, just face down on the table. Dies. His friends are like, oh, we killed him. In, yep. In the meantime, the man wakes up before the Lord. And God says, but you were doing so well. <laughs> now the man says, Lord, you didn't kill me over one drink and one cigarette, did you? The Lord says, no, you killed yourself. And that says, how could one drink, one cigarette kill anybody? It says, well, you see, you're deathly allergic to nicotine. And so you die. And he's like, really? You could have told me that. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Well, the Lord says, wasn't it better that you abstained from all these things all those years for the sake of being holy? Not just for the fear of death. And the man says, Lord, you know my wife. It would have been nice to have the option. <laughs> yeah. Today we find ourselves yes, in the rest of the story where we'll be talking about finishing strong, finishing well, right? Ending this race Strong. That's really the whole point. So if you're new, we're in the rest of the story. We're going through the whole Bible. It takes a while. It's a pretty big book, but we're honoring God's word here, and we're looking at all the parts of it, even the parts people don't like. So there's going to be a little bit of that in this sermon. So that's why I had to make the joke especially funny, because, you know, i got to lighten it up. So anyway, tough scriptures today. Uh, we've been looking at the accounts of the kings, and kind of get this pattern like good king, wicked king, good king, wicked king, back and forth type of thing going on. But we've seen 
even the best of them, are not without their faults. They sin. Right? So Hezekiah is good, but then his pride. So we're going to see the same kind of thing going on today. So we're going to hop right in. If you don't know, it's okay. There are books of the Bible that run in parallel. So we're in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. They tell the same-ish story with some different details. So I'm going to be hopping back and forth. It's confusing for me. Hopefully, it will unconfuse it for you. I don't know. We'll also be looking at the prophets. They weave their way through these accounts. So 2 Chronicles 34.1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor, David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. Then, in the twelfth year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines, the Asherah poles, and the carved idols and cast images. So, I'm just going to summarize some of these things for you. It can be really confusing because he goes through two rounds of this purification. And you'll get confused. If you read both, you're like, wait a minute, didn't he just do that? No. He does like kind of the short version, and then he expands it. So Asherah pole, phallic worship symbol, detestable, not good. So he's getting rid of all these detestable things. He's burning them. He's smashing them. He's taking the ashes and taking them away from Jerusalem. It says he burns the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars. We'll talk about that later. And finally, he returns to Jerusalem. 2 Kings 22 gives us like the short version. So we're going to stay for now in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 34.8. In the 18th year of his reign, after he had purified the land of the temple, Josiah appointed Shaphan, son of Azaliah, Maaseah, the governor of Jerusalem, and Joah, son of Joahaz, the royal historian, to repair the temple of his God. They gave Hilkiah the high priest the money that had been collected by the Levites who served as gatekeepers at the temple of God. The gifts were brought by people from Manasseh, Ephraim, and from all over the remnant of Israel, as well as from all Judah, Benjamin, and the people of Jerusalem. So the reason they mention the remnant, member, the northern kingdom, Israel falls first. But there's a remnant, right? So everybody's going to be joining in here. He entrusted the money. <clears throat> so in... Second Kings, I believe, it says he didn't even have to check up on them. Right? So they're trustworthy people. He entrusts them. They supervise the restoration of the temple. They pay the workers. They work faithfully. Now, something important happens as they're kind of repairing things. Second Chronicles 34, 14, while they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah, back pocket that name, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan. So something happens here. Shaphan goes to Josiah. The workers are doing well. Everything's coming along just fine. And oh, by the way, found this scroll. Kind of important. So Shaphan reads it to the king. His reaction, reaction second excuse me, Chronicles 34, 19. When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. He gave these orders to Hilkiah, Ahiakim, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan, the court secretary, and Asaiah, the king's personal advisor. Go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and for all the remnant of Israel and Judah. Inquire about the words written in the scroll that has been found. For the Lord's great anger has been poured out on us because our ancestors have not obeyed the word of the Lord. We have not been doing everything this scroll says we must do. So Hilkiah and the other men went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet Huldah. She was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, son of Haras, the keeper of the temple wardrobe. She said to them, Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Go back and tell the man, Josiah, who sent you, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on the city and its people. All the curses written in the scroll that was read to the king of Judah will come true. For my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to the pagan gods. And I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place and it will not be quenched. But go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you have just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against the city and its people. You humbled yourself and tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. I will not send the promised disaster until 
after you have died and been buried in, this, in peace. You yourself will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on this city and its people. So they take this message back to the king. So we're talking about the blessings and curses at the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 27, 28. So that's what they're talking about there. So if we hop over to 2 Kings, it gives us a little more information on this there. 2 Kings 23, 1. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. In this way, he confirmed all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll, and the people pledged themselves to the covenant. <clears throat> so this is interesting, right? You know how much reading that was? <laughs> if it was the law, that starts around Exodus 20, right? So you're like looking at Exodus 19, initiates at 20, 10 commandments. Then there are 603 more commands that he's going to be reading through the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy until he gets to the end, the curses. That's not a light read. I wonder if they got a lunch break. <laughs> but you see this. You see this. Joshua does this, Joshua 8. You see Ezra does it in Nehemiah, I believe, chapter 8 as well. They all stand and they listen as they read the entire book of the law. So if you're here today and you're new and you're like, is this guy going to just read the Bible to us today? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> Not the whole thing, though. So see, you've got it so easy. We're only doing like six to eight chapters. So they go through this another wave of this kind of, you know, purification of the land, if you will. He does away with all the bad, idolatrous things he grounds the ashes of the pole to dust and does away with it. He defiles the pagan shrines. Now, what's interesting is you're going to see like uh, something about uh, horse statues and chariots that are worshipped to the sun. So just more of these things that they worship, sun gods, things that aren't real gods. But what's interesting, you're going to see about the bones again. He burns the bones and he scatters them you know, over the altar, whatever, it sacrifices these things. Weird, why are they doing that? Well, in the Jewish train of thought, the bones represent a part of the body that's more permanent. Right? So they would have these ossuary, or whatever they're called, these bone boxes, just for argument's sake. Historians have what they believe is James, Jesus' brother's bone box without the bones in it. So they'd put them in a cave, they'd wait for the body to decompose, then take out the bones and put them in a smaller box. There's the resurrection. If you read Ezekiel chapter 37, you see the valley of the dry bones. You've probably heard about this if you've been in church. And so what it is, is this, this vision that the Lord is giving Ezekiel to show that there will be a future resurrection. So the bones rise up. Then he sees all this flesh come over them, kind of gross. And then his spirit goes in them. So there'll be a time, so that tells us, there'll be a time when he'll give us his spirit can be inside us. We see that come true in Acts. But in the future... There's a resurrection, so that's what that's all about. So the Jewish train of thought here is save the bones. But Josiah is like permanently killing them off. That's, the, that's it. You're done. Forget it. So it's really a big deal. It's a really bad thing when you're thinking of it through this lens. 2 Kings 23, 16. Then Josiah turned around and noticed several tombs in the side of the hill. He ordered that the bones be brought out, and he burned them on the altar at Bethel to desecrate it. This happened just as the Lord had promised through the man of God when Jeroboam stood beside the altar at the festival. Then Josiah turned around and looked up at the tomb of the man of God who had predicted these things. What is that monument over there? Josiah asked. And the people of the town told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted the very things that you have just done to the altar at Bethel. Josiah replied, leave it alone. Don't disturb his bones. So they did not burn his bones or those of the old prophet from Samaria. So this should take us to 1 Kings 13. If you remember Jeroboam, so they have the split. That's Israel, 1 King of Israel. He does the calf idols and all the really bad things. But then the prophet sent to denounce him. He actually uh, preaches or 
says something against the altar. Oh, altar, oh, altar. And then he says, Josiah is going to come and burn the bones of the priests on you. And then it's a really weird story because the guy's supposed to go back without eating anything. He disobeys the Lord, gets coaxed into another prophet's house. <laughs> if you remember, as he leaves, the lion comes out and kills him. Right? So the prophet that got him in trouble and lied to him cries about it. That's weird too. But leaves his donkey alive to show that this was like a sniper attack. It was just on the man. The lion doesn't kill the donkey. So that's what they're talking about here. Second Chronicles 35.1, then Josiah announced that the Passover of the Lord would be celebrated in Jerusalem. So the Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. Josiah also assigned the priests to their duties and encouraged them in their work at the temple of the Lord. They also put the ark back in. So this is a really bad day for PETA because Josiah donates 30,000 lambs for slaughter, you know, like 3,000 cattle, massive amounts of animals for the, the sacrifice necessary for the Passover feast. So it's huge. They do this big thing. And so when you're going through your Bible, you're getting all these details and numbers. Basically, the Levites and the priests are doing their thing. They're doing their work. They're preparing, like, the sacrifices for everybody. And then they eat it. The worship leaders eat it. And so it just goes through all of these details. And I'm not going to read you every single one of them. You can do that on your own. Big Passover. It says there's been none like it since the time of Samuel and none since. It's just, it's huge. It's, you gotta, we just can't imagine it. It's a massive, massive festival. Huge, big thing. But check this out. And this is usually where people stop. People, especially scholars, uh, rabbis, pastors, they love Josiah, right? Josiah, it's possible we can have a good king, All right? Second Chronicles 35, 20. And here's the thing. This is the value. And I would say, if you ever want to teach, read your whole Bible, <laughs> because this is where people get it wrong. A lot of these details get left out. You got to look at both of them. So here's where both of them are. Second Chronicles 35, 20. After Josiah had finished restoring the temple, King Necho of Egypt led his army up from Egypt to do battle at Carchemish on the Euphrates River. And Josiah and his army marched out to fight him. But Nico sent messengers to Josiah with this message. What do you want with me, king of Judah? I have no quarrel with you today. I am on my way to fight another nation, and God has told me to hurry. Do not interfere with God, who is with me, or he will destroy you. Some people stop there. I see commentators do this, right? So Josiah is great. Watch this. But Josiah refused to listen to Nico. Pay attention. To whom God had indeed spoken. And he would not turn back. Instead, he disguised himself and he led his army into battle on the plain of Megiddo. But the enemy archers hit King Josiah with their arrows and wounded him. He cried out to his men, take me from the battle for him. Badly wounded. So they lifted Josiah out of his chariot and placed him in another chariot. They brought him back to Jerusalem where he died. He was buried in the royal cemetery and all Jude and Jerusalem mourned for him. The prophet Jeremiah composed funeral songs for Josiah, and to this day, choirs still sing these sad songs about his death. The songs of sorrow have become a tradition and are recorded in the book of laments. But you were doing so well. But you were doing so well. So think about it. I've actually heard commentators, they're like, no, no, you know, we don't know on whose behalf Nico was working. Yeah, because you just read 2 Kings. <laughs> you got to keep reading and you find out. The Word of God translates itself pretty well. So don't start with commentaries because a lot of them are actually wrong. They're not all right. The Word of God is always right. So he messed up. And you might think, well, you may have heard this too. You know, well, Josiah, he didn't know who to believe. Really? Well, you know, a lot of the other kings kind of did something important called consulting the Lord. He could have done that, right? Did not. He failed massively here, right at the end. So basically, he trips right before the finish line. So it talks about Jeremiah's laments. So we capped off Isaiah last week. Next book, Jeremiah. They're not all in order, but right after Jeremiah's lamentations, right? So I'm going to take you to Jeremiah quickly, and we'll see a couple things. Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. These are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. Remember that name? one of the priests from the town of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. The Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. The Lord's messages continued throughout the reign of King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the 11th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another of Josiah's sons. So 
uh, it is going through the final king, skipping Jehoiachin. So what starts to happen is they're going to get deposed or taken away. Zedekiah is going to be the last king uh, at the fall. In August of that 11th year, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. Ah, you might know that verse, right? He says, oh, sovereign Lord, I can't speak for I'm too young. So what's kind of cool here is you get a verse of the day, but now you know the context. Kind of cool, right? So you can be that Bible nerd and be like really annoying and hop on there and be like, well, you really don't know. This is about Josiah. I'm not sure the context is right. I'm glad we're posting it here. So it's fine. This is one of my, my I don't get hung up on this one because it's good. <laughs> so you see that Hilkiah tie-in, a little note for the Bible nerds here. We're not quite sure. So this does not get raised to the level of definitely or clearly. That's the same Hilkiah. It's a probably. We're not entirely sure. But it's interesting to me. Priest during the same time. If we jump forward, check this out. Jeremiah 3.6, during the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you seen what fickle Israel has done? Like a wife who commits adultery, Israel has worshipped other gods on every hill and under every green tree. I thought, after she's done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her faithless sister Judah saw this. She saw that I divorced faithless Israel because of her adultery. So they're being compared to unfaithful brides. This happens a lot through the prophets. But that treacherous sister Judah had no fear, and now she too has left me and given herself to prostitution. Israel treated it all so lightly. She thought nothing of committing adultery by worshiping idols made of wood and stone. So now the land has been polluted. But despite all this, her faithless sister Judah had never sincerely return to me. She has only pretended to be sorry. I, the Lord, have spoken. What's interesting about Jeremiah, <clears throat> if you read the whole thing, doesn't say a whole lot about the good stuff Josiah does, like the rabbi buys in like priests or pastors today, where they just focus on that. Jeremiah really doesn't. <laughs> he condemns them. Right? So sometimes it's kind of like too little, too late. So that's what Jeremiah says. And he doesn't finish strong. Jeremiah also knows this because this. Well, we'll get there in a second. Let's look at what happens to his son. Second Chronicles 36, 1. If we continue there. Then the people of the land, so after Josiah dies, took Josiah's son Jehoahaz and made him the next king in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. Then he was deposed by the king of Egypt, who demanded that Judah pay 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold as tribute. So Josiah's mistake allows an opening for Pharaoh Necho, King Necho, to come in and grab his son up. And that's exactly what happens. He gets taken away captive. Future generations will sometimes pay, we looked at that last week, for our sin. And look at what Jeremiah says about it. Jeremiah 22.10. Do not weep for the dead king, Josiah, or mourn for his loss. Instead, weep for the captive king being led away, for he will never return to see his native land again. For this is what the Lord says about Jehoahaz, who succeeded his father, King Josiah, and was taken away captive. He will never return. He will die in a distant land and will never again see his own country. Interesting. Don't weep for Josiah. <laughs> Got this kid in a lot of trouble. Weep for him. What we learn from Josiah and what we learned in the past. What we do at every stage of our journey matters equally and especially at the end. It matters. Now, to apply it, how often do we start something really strong but then we don't finish very strong? Are we going with the same momentum and energy in December as we started with in January. It often happens. Why? What would it look like if we finished with the same determination with which we started something? Sometimes we start off strong. What we do along the way matters, but how we finish also matters. And here's the thing. We must always keep the original goal in mind. We must remain focused on that and have determination 
and these tasks. I'm going to do something a little interesting. If uh, you've never been here before, you might not have seen anybody do something like this uh, in church. Uh, but if you've been here for a while, I do it all the time. So I like to read whole books of the Bible to my people because it gives you the context, right? You understand. So whenever you're reading things, you need to look at what the context is and have that in your mind the entire time you're reading these verses. So when I see the verse of the day, if someone's not reading the Bible much, it's put the verse of the day up, it makes me think of the whole context. So I talk about Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm like, don't do that because I know I can think. I'm like, oh, man, and then Jeremiah was stuck in a cistern. He was about to die, and they had to bring him up with ropes, and they didn't want to hurt his arms, so they had to put the rags around. I'm thinking about all these horrible things. I know surrounding Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to send you away as captives. It's brutal. I know it talks about them, like, being so destitute that they're eating their own children. Like, women are hiding the afterbirths from, like, their husbands so they can eat it later. That's Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a tough read. And so I see the context. And so when someone's like, ooh, you know, I know the plans I have for you. Yeah, to go away in captivity for seven years, but to prosper after that, after that. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to live to see it. It's a corporate blessing and a corporate punishment. So it's not about your new car you know, <laughs> or your new job. So that's why I get annoyed. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read all of 2 Timothy to you today. All right? I have to read really fast and exercise my New York speaking skills, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to read you key verses or explain what's happening in all of 2 Timothy to you so that you can see on our point today, the book is like, if I had to give it a title, How to Finish Strong. Context. Paul is writing to his disciple Timothy from Rome in prison. He thinks he's probably going to die soon. We're not going to have the argument about where he died, how far he got. Forget it. He thinks, this is the point, so we're just right here. Paul has in mind, I'm going to die. I'm going to get executed. That's it. I'm in prison. So this is probably what he's thinking is like the last letter ever that he's going to write. He does tell Timothy, hey, come and see me. They allowed people to like take care of their needs in jail, but he thinks he's going to die. That's it. It's over. It's like Second Peter. He thinks he's going to die. So the New Testament isn't in order, but this could actually, like if you're doing it that way, like go towards the end. So Paul, he talks about his example. He starts there, right? And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news. That's why he's suffering here in prison. That's the whole thing. And he says, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching that you learn from me, a pattern shaped by faith and love in Christ Jesus. So how are you getting this right? Watch what I do. I'm about to finish strong here. Follow my example. That's a good thing. Then he talks about people not finishing strong. If you're following along, I'm not doing all the verses. I'm doing the key verses as to where it's pertinent to our topic today. He says, as you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even Phygelus and Hermogenes. So he calls them out. He's naming people that are deserting him. They're not finishing strong. So you see this? I'm finishing strong, Timothy. Follow my example. Do not, these two guys. Don't follow them. Chapter 2, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier. He's, remember, he's in so the context. Then, the next couple verses, I've seen people use them to say, oh, you know, look, it's all about soldiers and athletes. No, he's giving two examples, right? So, a soldier doesn't get caught up in the affair, right? The affairs of, like, civilian people. What, what is he talking about? You're single-minded. You're following orders, and you're getting it done. Athletes, right? He talks about athletes next and winning the prize. Why? Not like, hey, we should all be doing sports all the time. Not that sports are bad, but... Here's the thing, single mind, he wants you to think of like a soldier who's going to go to war and do his job, or an athlete who's going to finish strong. Again, going into the topic here. And he says, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. This spreads like cancer. In the case of Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have left the path of truth. Not going to be the verse of the day anytime soon, but it's important. Paul's saying they left to still look again. I'm going to give you two more examples. Don't be like those guys. All right, so they left the path of the truth. So how do we stay strong, Timothy might ask. Well, glad you asked, Tim. Here we go. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living 
faithfulness, love, and peace. It talks about enjoying the companionship of those who are doing those things. What? Run from lusts. Run. Not just like, you know, turn away from. No, he's assuming Timothy has already repented. Now I want you to get out of there. Run from these things because that will make you fall away. Again, I say don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel but must be kind to everyone. Except Democrats? No. Everyone must be kind to everyone. There you go. Chapter 3, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times where people will love only themselves and their money. Sounds a lot like today. They will be boastful and proud. There's that word proud again, not a good thing. Scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will slander others and have no self-control on the Facebook. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. There it is again. Suffering. Suffering. 2 Timothy 3.12. We can bring that up now. Real key verses. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Check this next sentence out. But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. Just soak that in for a second. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will. So think, think, I want you to think about what you're reading. It doesn't say people calling themselves Christians will suffer persecution. It doesn't say that. It says everyone who wants to live a godly life. Everyone who wants to, so meaning it's not just your label, it's what you're doing. Everyone who wants to actually like do this will suffer persecution. And it could be verbal, right? Yes. So if you've ever tried to be good at something or done something, well, maybe you can relate in the workplace, right? <laughs> I, just, I don't want to tell you. But anyway, maybe you, you, you got there, right, and, and, and you, you started strong, and you did your job well. You ever have someone say at work, like, hey, slow down, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you're making us look bad, right? But what if you go, no, 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 the Bible says that I have to honor, you know, my, my employers. I have to do a really good job. And you just keep doing well, right? Then they're going to start finding things like wrong or making problems for you. So think of it like that, right? If you want to, I can people like, yep. So there you go. You know, it's a quick story, but you know, it's like the postman Pete analogy. I know this guy named Pete who's a postman, and he got a job in the post office, and he got his mail route done in like a half hour or an hour. It's like the whole thing. And everyone came back, and they're like, don't do that. Because right? what were they doing? They were going out and eating. They are drinking. They are doing whatever they wanted to do. Like, Postman Pete, you're killing us, right? So they chased him out of there. He lost his job. So think about it that way, right? Like, simple example. It doesn't always mean, like, you're going to get your, your head cut off or something. Simple example. But check this out. But evil people and imposters will flourish. That verse is never going to be preached at a megachurch. Never. Flourish. Who's going to flourish? Who's going to suffer? What does Jesus say? The road is narrow. That's what Jesus said. The megachurch says a whole bunch of other things. No, no, no. I realized another sentence I learned in pastor school that was stupid, just stupid mantras. We're here to empty hell and fill heaven. So you're going to accomplish something that Jesus said cannot be done. Really? Pray tell how. Are you going to die on a cross for them? Because Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, the road's narrow, this is hard. He says crazy things that you never hear. You have to give up everything if you want to follow me. And that's not just the young rich ruler. He says that another time as well. It's crazy. Right? So, not supposed to be, but the evil people, they're going to be the ones in the last time who are flourishing. They're going to be the ones who are garnishing all of these followers. Why? Because they're telling them whatever they want to hear. 2 Timothy 4.1, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus who will solemnly, or someday, judge, look at that word, the living and the dead, put that in your back pocket when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. So here we go, if you didn't believe me. <laughs> 2 Timothy 4.3, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever 
their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Let that soak in. I know a lot of you have heard these verses, but absorb that. Right? Pastor, why aren't there thousands of people at your church? My retort to that would be, why are there thousands of people at your church? The Bible says, no. <laughs> it started out that way in Acts, but when we get to 2 Timothy, no. He's telling Timothy the opposite. People will reject. Pastor Gene, you get up, I have been told by pastors. You, you, it's too much Bible. People can't handle it. I'm like, Hebrews is a sermon. <laughs> I can just read Hebrews, and that's what it would have been. That's it. Sermon on the Mount, Matthews 5 through 7. Sermon, about 19 topics. Gene, you're jumping around. I'm preaching the word. And they tell me, well, people, they're just, they're, they don't like that. They're not going to stick around for that. So what do you do? Okay, I'll dumb it. Nope. No, stay faithful to the word. Timothy, so when I read this, Paul's talking to me. He's saying, stick with it, finish strong. 2 Timothy 4, 6. As for me, Paul's talking, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Another person, don't name your kid. Demas has deserted me. He loves the things of this life has gone to Thessalonica, Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Demas has deserted me because he loves what? The things of this life, the things of the world. He fell away. So you think of Paul finishing strong, but he's also giving you example after example after example. People who love the world are going to fall away. People who reject true teaching, I don't want to hear the Bible and what it says. You're going to fall away. That's what Paul's saying. Look at all these people. They're falling away. They chased after myths or these things that they're not in the Word. But here's the thing. All who finish strong will get the prize when Jesus comes back. This is what we have to keep in mind. Paul finishes strong. Why is it important? Because it doesn't really matter, and this is a hard truth, what you've done along the way if you don't finish strong. So think of it like a race. You could be way ahead of everybody if you're running a race. But if you decide not to cross the finish line, that doesn't matter. You can't go back to the guy who won and say, I was beating you. I mean, people do this, I know. <laughs> you know, I was beating you, though. I was winning. You're not getting the prize, so it doesn't matter. The only way to get the prize is to finish strong. So we talked about the prophets weaving their way through these accounts. Jeremiah is not the only one. So as we kind of draw to a close here, I want to take a look at Zephaniah. <clears throat> so Zephaniah 1.1. Nobody really talks about Zephaniah, three-chapter book. The Lord gave this message to Zephaniah when Josiah, son of Ammon, was king of Judah. Zephaniah was son of Cush, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. So it, during this time, <clears throat> the main point is to shake people out of their complacency before it's too late. That's it. Like if you just want that... I wrapped it up for you. Shake you out of complacency before it's too late. You get that highlighted right in the center of it, Zephaniah 2.1. Gather together, yes, gather together, you shameless nation. Gather before judgment begins, before your time to repent is blown away like chaff, before it's too late. Act now before the fierce fury of the Lord falls and the terrible day of the Lord's anger begins. Seek the Lord, all who are humble, and follow his commands. Seek to do what is right and live humbly. Perhaps even yet the Lord will protect you, protect you from his anger on that day of destruction. So here we see the day of the Lord. Jesus is coming back. That's what this is about. In the future, in 2 Timothy, in their time, it's both. The Lord is going to rain destruction down on Judah for what they've done. We saw that in Jeremiah. And then there's going to be a future day of the Lord. And that's where Jesus comes back. So that's what you have to understand. So we have to finish. That's what this is saying here. <laughs> finish be strong before Jesus comes back. Don't get complacent. And here's the thing. Quickly, as we finish, we went to Romans 6. We do Romans a lot. I want to show you some things about that book. Romans 6, we're not slaves to sin. We're not called to be slaves to sin. No, you're not supposed to go on sinning. That's not a good thing. 
I usually, when I talk about judgment or the coming time of judgment, I like to go to Romans 14 because it clearly says that we Christians will be judged. Here's another very bad teaching. I've heard people say this. I won't be judged. I'm a Christian. God's not going to judge me. Absolutely wrong. Don't ever listen to that. Read your Bible. I'll give you at least three places where you can see it clearly says, clearly, that Christians will be judged first. Clearly. Don't live like that. That's a <laughs> terrible teaching. Why would you say that? Well, because you just want to keep sinning, right? That's why. Well, we're never going to be judged. And Jesus died for he, <laughs> he died for your sins, not so that you could keep doing it, so you keep sinning. Very important. So I'm going to read you, and this is interesting because a lot of people skip over this, but it talks about judgment in Romans a lot faster than you think. They're not getting along. All right, so the Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians, they're not getting along, and so Paul's like trying to level the playing field here. But in the midst of it, he says this, Romans 2, 5. Now, he's like kind of condemning the Jews here. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But... He will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves and refuse to obey the truth instead of, of living lives of wickedness. Huh, that's interesting. Romans 2.16, and this is the message I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. For some, there are people saying they're all in. Right? They're checking off the Sunday box. But when you call them to do it, we are saved by grace, not by works. Ephesians 2. I know the verses. All right, so we start at verse 8. All right, so that nobody can boast when we get to 10. And we are created for good works in Christ Jesus. So the works are the fruit of our faith. And if we bear no fruit, what does Jesus and John the Baptist say? They say the same thing. They'll be cut down and thrown in the fire. What do you think they mean by that? I'll show you. So it's interesting, Revelation is actually quoted. You might have thought of that when I said that. And when we sung those lyrics on the screen, fire in his eyes, it makes me think of Revelation, rightfully so. Zephaniah is quoted, it's 3.13, <coughs> quoted in Revelation 14.5. But if we keep reading, we get to the end of the story. So you get to like Revelation 19. And indeed, like the song, Jesus comes back, flames of fire in his eyes, robed, dipped in blood. The word of God, the word of God, judgment sword coming out of his mouth. Mentions it in the beginning, mentions it again here. It says back there, double-edged sword. Think Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4. It, it exposes, it cuts through bone and marrow, exposing our innermost desires. He is the word of God in both sentence, senses. It comes out of his mouth, the word of God, and it's a judgment sword. It's this crazy picture, right? So then you see something interesting. He wins the battle. Satan's kind of like locked up. Let's just think of it that way. Then there's the first resurrection. And the first resurrection is of all the people who were, and it literally says, beheaded for Jesus. They got martyred. That's why in the early church, people were like begging to get themselves killed somehow. They would volunteer to go to the Colosseum, let the lions eat me. That's not a joke. You were glorified in your martyr because they believed this stuff and they thought, wow, if I get like beheaded or killed for Jesus, I get to raise up first and reign with him for 1,000 years. How about that? Kind of cool. Please. Because they believed it. That's what was going on. So we have debates about the 1,000 years. Not going to do that. So let's just say it's 1,000 years, right? Then you have the final defeat of Satan. Then it says this, Revelation 20, 11, And I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both the great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire." This lake of fire is the second death. Anyone's whose name, anyone whose name is not found in the, recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. 
I'm realizing as I'm speaking that I forgot to bring the other points, the other scriptures. All right, so you can go to Romans 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Peter 4. Not giving you the exact verses, even though I know them, because I want you to read the whole thing. Get the context, right? So those are your verses that say Christians will be judged. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Peter 4, 17, give you a little hint. And if you go to Romans 14, it clearly says it over and over and over again. And here, it says it again. Now, that should scare you. That should scare you. If it doesn't scare you, you have to do a faith check. That's what you have to do. do you have to ask yourself, do I believe this? I believe this. It's scary. But here's the other side of it. Let's talk about our motivation. Check these awesome verses out. Revelation 21.1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Beautiful. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And they said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. All who are victorious, all who finished the race strong. So this week as we go out, our motivation as Christians should be twofold. Balance. Everybody wants one thing or the other. No. A balanced Christian life, motivation is twofold in that. We have a fire. <laughs> you got the fear of the Lord. Read your Bible again. It says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and insight. You can't be smart without fear of the Lord. So you need some motivation. But out in front of us, that's gonna doing one of these, but out in front of us, hope. That's in front of us. So as we go out this week, focus on the hope. But you are doing so well. How do you not hear that ever again? Well, focus on Jesus. Focus. No tears, no crying, no pain. No matter what you're going through right now, that's all gone when Jesus comes back. It says we won't even need the sun. It says the earth is going to melt away. Gone. All this stuff. Gone. All the corruption, all the evil people, gone. The earth melts. We don't need a sun because God is finally enough. That's it. That's your hope. Keep your eye on the prize. It's greater than anything, anything we could hope to have here. Put your faith and trust here, nowhere else implicitly, and run that race for the prize in Christ Jesus. Amen? All right, let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church that is the people, the body of Christ as we fellowship later. Just please to continue to unite us in your Holy Spirit. And even after we leave the building, we go out and make us vehicles of your grace, mercy, peace, and love. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.